Hello and welcome back to A Little Lily Princess Week 2. Uh, you might notice that there is no background music this time around. That's because the first episode got a copyright claim, which meant that I had to mute the music. And while I don't feel good about it, it's not so important to this game. I've had this issue before, but that was in a game where the music was a very large part of the game's vibe. I would say it's less of it's less important for this. So that's why the music is muted. Anyway, in the last episode, we did had the first week of Lily's first uh, week of school for uh, classy young ladies at, while moving to London. And um, she wasn't originally from there as her father was a captain and she has spent most of her time in India. Um, things went relatively well, and we got closer to one of the girls, which I suppose is the whole idea here. So, let's continue. Girls, are you ready? Form up in the line behind Lavinia. Sarah, dear, it's our custom to walk to and from church every Sunday, when the weather permits. That allows the horses a day of rest and ensures that the students receive regular exercise. It is important to look your best when we're walking out among the public. We want our school to always leave a good impression. You should follow Lavinia's cues. She will show you what to do. Lavinia is always a model student. As if hearing her name, Lavinia smiled and tilted her head. You can learn a great deal from Lavinia, dear. And as her father is also posted to India, the two of you should really have much in common. I'm sure you will make close friends. Now go on and stand in line behind her. Sarah made her way to the front of a line where Jesse and Lavinia stood close together. What are you doing? Go to the back. Miss Minchin told me to stand behind you. She said you were a model. Oh, very well then. But that's my place. You wouldn't want to disobey Miss Minchin, would you? No. We have to show our, our new girl how to behave herself in church. She may never have seen one before. Sarah, Sarah thought it was wise, wisest to remain silent. Okay, so here's how we did in the last week. I think we will get a little more confidence, so less reading books. Uh, as um, In case you didn't watch the first episode, um, each of these uh, blocks of days has these activities that you can do. And as you see on the left, they each do different things. Though there is uh, a chance, as it says, each activity has three possible outcomes. So even if you read a book all through the week, you should have different things happening to improve Sarah as a character. Okay, let's see. So Sunday we went to church. Hmm. I'm, try I'm trying to play the character as how I imagine her life would be. So I'm not specifically trying to go for any particular stat. I'm more going for how would I have lived out this girl's life if it was me. I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea. Time will tell. But I definitely think it's working out so far. So I see no reason not to continue. Uh, we definitely need to have one day where we write in a diary, I think. Uh, yeah, let's go for a walk. I don't think we don't have, we haven't done that yet. Um, probably that. Uh, you can use this one and uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's play with toys on Friday. Done. Hmm. Okay. So Grace, we are missing a bit on. It seems with these bars that the top part is 10. So three plus to knowledge, two plus to vigor, 
one to patience, which we haven't had anything in before. Sympathy, that's all there, and belief have also gotten something now. Okay. A knock came at the door. Sarah? Sarah, dear? Yes, is there? Oh, hello. The boy with you, mademoiselle. Miss Minchin hissed through her teeth, and the young woman in the maid's uniform fell silent. Sarah, before he left, your father arranged for a maid to be employed, especially for your needs. She has just arrived. I believe she is from France. Y yes. Her name is Mariette, and she will be living in your rooms, helping you with your clothing in the morning and anything else you require. Please use her as your liaison with the staff. If you have need of food, send your maid rather than speaking to the cook directly. And don't let her fool you. She does speak the Queen's tongue. She swept out of the room, leaving the maid and her new little mistress blinking at each other in confusion. Bonjour, Mariette. Je m'appelle Zara. Comment allez-vous? Très bien, merci. And I am pleased to see that you are just as your papa described you. Oh, what did he say? That no little, that no other little girl is as solemn as you, and that would make me, and that you would make me smile. But why would being solemn make someone smile? Ah, it is your je ne quoi, it is you. Now, why don't you show me around your rooms? Oh. Okay, so we actually have. Oh, so we don't have what we need for uh, for Jesse, but we do have. Oh. We actually only have the event for Mariette. Oh, so she is also a possible girl. Ew. Interesting. I really love these chibi models. Like, they are so adorable. Uh, yeah. Why would we... I mean, unless I don't have an option, I wouldn't... I would not definitely not skip an event. So, play this event. Mariette, may I? Is it alright if I ask you a few questions about yourself? Bien sûr, mademoiselle. What do you wish to know? I'm sorry about my, my butchering of the, fr of the French language. It is not a language that I have been taught, and as a result, it is not something that uh, I have the correct pronunciation of. Anyway. What is your family name? Miss Minchin did not say. Dumas, mademoiselle. Oh, are you a relative of the great French writer, the author of The Three Musketeers? Mariette chuckled kindly. No, mademoiselle. Ah, well, not in a close way, I'm not. There are many with the name of Dumas, and I cannot know what connections there are between all people. Do you know all of your cousins and your cousin's cousins, all who bear the name of Crewe? I don't know anyone except named Crewe except for myself and my papa. So you see, I cannot say who my relatives might be at some distance. Sarah nodded. Where in France do you come from? I grew up in Limon. You may have heard uh, of the Limon box, the porcelain. Sarah shook her head. I will. They were famous once. Perhaps they will be once again. For now, I like much of Limogi. They have faded. What is it like there? Ah, what is it like anywhere? It's a city not as large as Paris or London, no. Is it near Paris? No, Patepo, Patepo. It's in the south. You must really, you must rely on the railways to travel between them. All trains lead to Paris. Sarah tried to picture it. She did not know Limo. Limo. I, I, I'm really sorry, but French is like. It's not my. I'm, I think I'm probably better at Italian than French. Um, oh, anyway. But if it was, if it was in the south, then it must be green and war, warm and green, surely. She had seen paintings of France, stone houses, arches and bridges, rolling green hills and hanging vines, and sunlight, always sunlight, not the fogs of London. It must be lovely. As you say, mademoiselle. How did you come to take this position? What I mean to say is, my papa and I did not have time to visit France, and I did not meet you until you came here. Did you meet my papa somewhere else? No, we have never met in flesh and blood. Your papa? He is a gentleman and knows many other gentlemen in fine cities like Paris. When it happened that he wished to appoint a maid, he wrote to this Paris gentleman to describe you. And I, I have a cousin who works for this Paris gentleman, and he thought of me, and so the arrangements were made. And I am glad they were. 
Sarah smiled. The gentle warmth of Mariette's regard was very comforting for a little girl who had been separated from her family and made to live in a far-off place. It was true that Mariette was, for the most part, only another stranger, like any other in Miss Minchin's seminary. They were only just beginning to know each other. And yet Mariette was not simply a stranger who might come and go like the students. She was Sarah's maid, the beginnings of her very own household. She might, in time, be the closest thing to a family. I wonder about the friend my papa has in Paris. Has in Paris. <laughs> you got stuck in French there. I wonder if he ever if he ever knew my mother. New week. Oh, well, that's pretty fast. Well, let's take two then. It was the beginning of another week of classes, and the students were seated neatly in rows in the schoolroom. Miss Minchin walked up and down between the desk, ensuring that each pupil's head was bowed to her particular lessons. She paused beside Sarah, a book in her hand. Now, Sarah, as your papa has engaged a French maid for you, I conclude that he wishes you to make a special study of the French language. Um, I think he engaged her because he, he thought I would like her, Miss Minchin. I'm afraid that you may have been something of a spoiled little girl, and as such you always imagine that things are done because you like them. It is a fault in you, and one that we must endeavor to train away. I... My impression, Sarah is that your papa wished for you to learn French. I never really learned to speak French, but, but that is quite enough. You have never learned, and so you must begin at once. The French master, Monsieur Defarge, will be here in a few minutes. Take this book and look at it until he arrives. Dutifully, Sarah stared at the illustrated pages in front of her. Le père, the father, la mère, the mother. You look rather cross, Sarah. I'm sorry you do not like the idea of learning French. I, mean, I am very fond of it, but... You must not say but when you are told to do things. <laughs> Miss Abbott, young lady, should not make dreadful sniggering noises like a horse. Yes, Miss Minchin. Sarah, look at your book again. Yes, Miss Minchin. Le fil, the son, le frère, the brother. Oh, dear. Shortly after, Monsieur Dufarge arrived in the classroom. The French master was an elderly gentleman with a neatly trimmed moustache and beard, and hair that flew outwards in dramatic points. His eyes lit up when he caught sight of an unfamiliar little girl puzzling over a book of French phrases. Ah, it's a new p is this a new pupil for me, madame? Her papa, Captain Crewe, is very anxious that she should begin the that she should begin the language, but I'm afraid she has a childish prejudice against it. She does not seem to wish to learn. I am very sorry to hear that, mademoiselle. Perhaps when we begin to study together, I may show you that it is a charming tongue. Little Sarah rose in her seat. She was beginning to feel rather desperate. S'il vous plaît, monsieur, je ne peux pas le faire comprendre. She began to explain quite simply in pretty and fluent French. Madame had not understood. She had not learned French exactly. Not out of books, but her papa and other people had always spoken to her, and she had read it, read it, written it, as she had read, written, had read and written English. Her papa loved it, and she loved it because he did. Her dear mama, who had died when she was born, had been French. What? What on earth? What is she saying? Is this some form of joke? Ah, uh, madame, there is not much I can teach her. She has not learned French. She is French. Her accent is exquisite. You, you ought to have told me. I... Tried, I suppose I did not begin right. <laughs> Miss Minchin slammed her hand upon the desk. Silence, young lady, silence at once. And though the other students soon settled back into proper schoolroom behavior, Miss Minchin's lips remained tightly pressed together whenever she looked at Sarah. Oh, this is not good. Okay, hmm. Again, I think we've gained a little more confidence, so definitely, um, Practice that. Maybe a tea party to make uh, to make people understand and to maybe explain things. Like I know these things aren't aren't what is happening, but that's essentially how I am playing the character. Uh, yeah, let's go right into the area on Wednesday and um, read a book and uh, should we go for a walk or practice or play with toys? No, let's do this. Hmm. 
looking pretty balanced so far. So archer, ooh, wow, look at that archery. <laughs> one knowledge, six archery, ooh. Two patience, three grace, and one sympathy. If the French language fell naturally from Sarah's lips, there were other lips from which it seemed it could not escape at all, no matter how long the owner stared at her workbook. Le père, the father, le... No, la mare, the mother. To Hermengard, it seemed almost in unbelievable that a girl of her own age could string together so many words of French as if they were mere trifles. Dismayed at her own failing, she was devoting more effort than usual to the trial of understanding her lessons. Her elbows rested on the desk, her hands under her chin as she repeated the broken syllables under her breath. She stared so hard and bit the ribbon of her, on her pigtail so fast that she attracted the attention of Miss Minchin, who, feeling extremely cross at the moment, immediately pounced upon her. Miss St. John, what is the meaning of such conduct? I... what? Remove your elbows, take your ribbon out of your mouth, sit up at once. Yes, Miss Minchin. <laughs> Matters did not improve for Miss St. John when the French master himself arrived. Good... Bread le bon bang? Kindly though he was, Monsieur Duvage could not help but smile at her pronunciation. That's not quite correct. Écoutez bien le bon pain. Le bon pain? <laughs> Girls, conduct yourselves. It isn't funny, really. They ought not to laugh. Poor thing. It was a way of hers always to want to spring into any fray which someone was made uncomfortable or unhappy. However, there was no way for any hero to defend or rescue Ermengarde from the horrors of education, at least not until the lesson period had concluded. Oh, we got th four options now! Ooh. So now we also have Ermengarde. Lordy, we need belief. I don't know why that belief is needed for Lottie. Hmm. And there is still one that we have not yet met. <laughs> uh, well, I, can, I think I play the character, so let's go for er Ermengard St. John. Having made up her mind to befriend the unfortunate Ermengard, Sarah first had to seek her out. Someone like Lavinia could be easily tracked down from a distance by the sharp sound of her voice or the drumming heels of little girls stampeding away from her presence. Ermengarde, however, kept largely to herself and did not make a great deal of noise. Sarah found her, at last, bundled rather discon disconsolately in a window seat. Forthright and fearless, Sarah walked over to offer a friendly greeting. Hello, what is your name? Her name, of course, was already known as they had been introduced, however briefly upon Sarah's arrival at the school. This was, however, the traditional things that little girls always said to each other by the way of beginning an acquaintance. The etiquette of children has its own observances. Um, my name's Ermengarde St. John. Mine's Sarah Crew. This is very pretty. It sounds like a storybook. Do, do you like it? To understand why she fluttered so nervously, one must recall that a new pupil at a school is, for a short time, a very uncertain thing. Cliques and friendships in a small environment can become very firmly set indeed and leave no room for the excluded no matter how many years might pass. To the friendless, then, a new student brings with her a new breath of hope. Here is someone who is not yet claimed. Perhaps she will like me. And yet, she is unknown, friendship may not be a possibility. A new girl could equally be snobbish or foolish or mean-spirited. The hope is always adulterate with fear. This pupil was even more noteworthy than the most, for rumours about her had filled the schools even before her arrival. She had her own carriage, her own maid, and her rooms were like no one else's. Her wardrobe was exquisite. She had the adventure of a voyage from India to discuss. It was no wonder that Ermengarde was somewhat tongue-tied upon being addressed. I like yours. Your name? She bit her lip in chagrin at her own stumbling. Sarah held out her hand, not as a grand lady might for a gentleman to touch it, but as if greeting someone who was already a friend. 
After only a moment's hesitation, Ermagard took it. I'm very pleased to meet you. Oh, me too. Oh, you should meet Emily as well. Who is Emily? Come up to my room and you shall see. All right. They jumped down from the window seat together and went upstairs. Is it true? Is it true that you have a whole playroom to yourself? The ordinary pupils at Miss Minchin's select seminary had only small bedrooms of their own, enough space to sleep and dress and read if they were inclined, but for most activities they must venture out. Yes, Papa asked Miss Minchin to let me have one. She opened the door and beckoned Ermengarde inside. See, there's a, there's a sitting room through that door. Oh, it's beautiful. Sometimes when I'm playing, I make up stories about the things that I'm doing and tell them to myself. And I don't like people to hear me. It spoils it if I think people might listen. Does that sound too selfish of me? I do tell stories for others as well. It's only that some stories, particularly new ones, that I'm only just making up are private. They are too delicate to be shared. Ermengarde had paused, her eyes wide. You made them up? How... How can you do that? Why, anyone can make th up things. Have you never tried? But where do stories come from? Inside my head. Don't you ever imagine things that might happen that haven't? You must have dreams when you sleep, at least. Ermengarde shook her head, her braids wobbling. I try not to think about things like that. They're too confusing. I try to think only about what I'm supposed to be learning at school. I try very hard, but it doesn't seem to help. Sarah found the concept of a girl with no imagination at all to be too, all too difficult to grasp. Surely you must read storybooks about things that aren't real. Oh no, I hate to read. Seeing that this response disappointed Sarah, she fished for a better explanation. I don't read well, I can't concentrate, the words run together, and it's so hard to remember anything that I read in a book. I am meant to read a great many books from Miss Minchin's classes, but I get them all mixed up. When we read poems after history, I thought that Christabel was the daughter of the King of Spain. I don't want to read anything more than I absolutely must. I'd only make a muddle of it. And if I tried to make up a story, then how would I remember what was real and what wasn't? But, but it's good that you can. What if you read stories about fairies or dragons? Surely you would get those confused with things at school. But I might. You are very like a fairy and you are here at school. I'm sorry, I'm very dull and slow. Everyone says so. I understand if you do not wish to spend any more time with me. Sarah patted Ermengarde on the shoulder in a companionable fashion. Everyone is different. I'm only sorry that it means that I cannot share my favorite books with you. I have so many favorites that I love and wish that you could love them too. Oh, I have an idea. Perhaps if I read them to you, then you would not get them confused with other books. I don't know. Hesitantly, she smiled. I could try. Good. Did you see that darling little blue and yellow bird on the way back from the church? It was only a blue tit. They are hopelessly common. I hadn't seen one before. They're country birds. They're like trees, so you don't see them so much in London. There must be many more birds in the country. Are there any birds in England that are blue all over? I don't think so. Are there any blue birds in India? Well, there are some birds with bright blue feathers, but not all over, and some birds that are blue all over, but only a bit blue. I thought that perhaps in England I might find the blue bird of happiness. What is that? I shall tell you, all of you, come to my room and we shall have tea delivered. You shouldn't give orders to cook. It's not proper for a young lady to go into to the kitchens. Oh, I won't go. My maid Mariette will fetch the tea for us. You have your own personal maid to bring you tea? Yes, my father arranged for her to come from France. Come and say hello. Sarah and her entourage were greeted at the door. Oh, so many visitors. If it's all right, would you please bring tea for my guest, Mariette? Oui, mademoiselle. Mariette went once to the kitchens to carry out her little mistress's orders. The head cook of Miss Minchin's select seminary looked up at Mariette's approach, her face as pinched as to do. And uh, now, what's this then? Afternoon tea for four. Oh, is that all? I expect she'll be wanting fresh cakes too. Never mind that we haven't any made. Ah, no. 
They are biscuits already. Never seen that. Stop one of those girls from wanting more. Quick as you please. It is perhaps so, but son, but not with my mistress. Elle de l'air d'une princesse set petite. She thanks me for my work just as if she were thanking a grand lady. Hmm. Even as her fair, you mean. As she wishes it, still I am very pleased with my place. Now, the tea. Well, I think we shall wait with next week's uh, activities for the next episode. It's already been a little longer than I anticipated, but that's how it goes. I usually try to make episodes around 20 to 30 minutes, unless it's something where the story is something very heavy. Anyway, so until next time, take care.